And now, we'll meet our special guest, Mr. Saleh Gadi Johar. Mr. Saleh Gadi Johar is a U.S. citizen resident in California, USA. He's a writer and author of two books. Also, he's a, uh, he's a publisher of awati.com website. It's an American-based website. Gadi is a human rights activist. Having said that, he's also, he has also interviewed many prominent leaders, including the late Ethiopian uh, Prime Minister, Milas Dinawi. Please welcome Gadi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Honorable Adam Brandt, Federal MP, uh, Grant Mills, Marie Bonon Council, Our Excellency Representative of Botswana, Ms. Hedy Goldberg, His Honorable Consul General of the Federal Republic of Somalia, Yanis Hashi, Mr. Chin Tan, Chairperson BMC, who, with whom I became friends in two minutes, uh, Ashley Dickinson, Victoria Police Commander, Lee Scott, AFP, religious and African community leaders, and invited guests, members of the African communities, elders, and children. I wish to acknowledge elders of the Wurundjeri people and the elders of other Aboriginal communities, past and present. Please join me in honoring the people, land, and the vibrant spirit of this nation. Please also allow me to pay my respect to my elders, my relatives, my friends and compatriots, particularly my dear mother. Uh, you might be surprised to know that my speech of today is inspired by her. In fact, she kept telling me what to say and how to say it all of last night. <laughs> so in a way, I'll be delivering her speech. My colleagues here have given me a wider scope about human rights in the Horn of Africa, and they wanted me to do it in 15 minutes, and I will try. I will start with an article that recently appeared in Al Jazeera. It's written by Dr. Abdus Sattar Qasim, a well-known writer in the Middle East. He says that democracy is a culture and not a political decision. The West is skilled in it because it is their daughter and a culmination of their historical development. He says, but us, we have a different historical experience. That would be my introduction to how we view things and within that context, the issue of human rights. Two years ago, I was in a free speech forum in Oslo Norway, and uh, a friend introduced me to a Sudanese activist, and uh, we were chatting after the session, and I asked him when he was going back home. He said, he's not going back home. I asked, why? He said, because he'll be arrested. I said, why? Because you are just an activist, and why, why would he be arrested? He said that he has been communicating with foreign agencies, human rights activists, and he's not sure with whom he was communicating. But he told me that he was reporting the day-to-day -day activity of senior Sudanese officials. And uh, I was surprised a bit, and I said, then, of course, if you go back, you will be accused of treason. He said, yes. So I think my friend is still waiting until al-Bashir and his government is overthrowing Sudan so that he can go back. When I used to travel to Ethiopia frequently in the 90s, I would usually go to the Hilton Hotel. That's the best place to meet who is who of Addis at the time. And I would see parking lots full of cars with license plates of charity groups and humanitarian groups, which they call Erdata. That is the license. And I used to wonder, what are these people who are supposed to help the poor doing in this very expensive place? I never got the answer. I will also see some people in dusty, small tea shops 
in the streets of the, of the city who have just come from some remote areas after digging some wells or giving some lectures or trying to improve uh, the lot of the people who are outside the capital city. Some of them are on a fact-finding mission or simply there to recruit human rights activists like our Sudanese friend, people who report on the government secrets. Of course, that has become a human right issue as well. Elsewhere in the cities and villages of the Horn of Africa, most people would not take notes of what is happening in the capital city because they will be so busy struggling with day-to-day -day life. They wouldn't be interested in a freedom of expression or any basic human rights that we in this room take for granted. The concept of human rights is relatively new, even the West, including Australia, which is not West, geographically speaking. It came into being only after World War II, after the Holocaust and what culminated from that. And uh, by then, most of slavery and all sorts of feudal and class oppression was almost eradicated from the West. So the West had it in the right time, and that's when we had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. At least slavery was abolished in its traditional sense. I mean, we do not have any more plantations with 13-year-old boys sleeping under the loom of a dusty factory floor. We now have 13-year-olds being denied education and hope. I have traveled all over the Horn of Africa except Somalia. And I don't think anybody can blame me for that. At least in the last two decades, it was not safe to travel to Somalia. But I do not need to go to Somalia. There is an umbilical cord that ties Somalis with Eritreans. I never felt that I do. I do not know Somalia. Probably I met and know more Somalis than any of the other countries of the Horn of Africa. I've also traveled extensively around the world and I visited many countries. And why do I feel you will not be surprised when I say that the happiest, enviable people from the Horn of Africa live in Australia? This is my first visit to this country. And since I know almost all Eritreans living in Australia, I have heard a lot about this country and I have read enough. But this visit gave me a chance to see firsthand how people live in this country. I was pleasantly shocked by the level of tolerance, freedoms, rights, and diversity that I witnessed. I was amazed when I compared... Thank you. I was amazed when I, the, when I compared the diversity that I would like to agree, to disagree with Mr. Tan, is manufactured, it's not homegrown. This diversity is realized after a lot of investments, a lot of vision, and a lot of hard work. It didn't come just like that. You manufactured it, and hooray for that. But we have, we have this naturally. For example, my hometown, my, my home country, Eritrea, is composed of nine languages. People speak nine different languages different tribes, it's natural, we didn't manufacture it. Ethiopia has about 80 ethnic groups. Sudan is the same, now with South Sudan, I don't know which is which, so the math needs some time. But there is Somalia, and Somalia is composed of people who speak one language, and all are Muslims. Yet, we see the bloodiest suffering in Somalia. Why did that happen? I think the secret is evolution in the political sense. And some evolutions turn bad, not in Australia, and not the evolution of the concept of human rights. I'm so, I sometimes wonder and ponder about the right-wing rhetoric in my country, the USA, 
some of whom continuously argue that some regions cannot handle democracy or human rights. To the uninterested surface observer, it might seem so. But I was offended, and I always feel offended. Do they really think that we people like to be pushed around and do things we don't like to do? Do they think that we like to suffer and see blood and suffering and our country being wrecked left, right, and center? No, we don't. That is when I cling to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that's when, again, I become disillusioned. Do those who try to help us improve our conditions by promoting human rights really understand our situation? What really is the crux of the matter? I'm not sure most people know this. Our region is part of an area, an area that is so chaotic, and God has sent most known prophets there. David, Moses, Noah, Jonah, Job, even one who carried my name, Saleh, Christ, Muhammad, and many others. Why all that concentration of prophets in one region? So that tells you that we evolved by receiving divine guidance over time. And we don't seem to break from that. So we're expecting another prophet to come and lead us out of this trouble that we're in. And I don't think that will happen. <laughs> you see, the biggest problem with human rights that I see is human rights are envisioned in the West, which is based on an individual and due to socioeconomic development as envisioned in our region which is the fact that group rights precede individual rights. And this is the biggest problem that we face. How do we marry those two interests without leaving our traditions, without violating group rights? And this, I think, is the homework that is waiting to be worked. And that would probably solve our problems. But what makes it worse is ignorance. And religious indoctrination has been used for political ends on the believing communities very successfully. Traditions are very entrenched, and the resistance to modernity is a tough stance. The other thing that is crippling the Horn of Africa is bad governance, which has prevented people from evolving. There are still people who go several generations back to trace one's blood purity to make sure that the bride or a groom does not have slave ancestry. This is our fact. We still have a prevalent use of the term slave in local language to dark skinned people when we're all dark, but the lighter seems to be. Ethiopians use it to refer to their dictator, Mangustu, almost as if it was his second name. Baria, which means slave. So we have those anti-human rights culture entrenched, and we need to get rid of this. And to do that, we need good governance. Female genital uh, mutilation is too common, and it's not even prescribed in any religion. It's believed to be inherited from the days of the pharaohs of Egypt, and it's too common in our part of the world a few exceptions probably in some parts of Ethiopia. Now, how do we dedicate of such things to a community that travels 10 kilometers to fetch a pail of water, and that is if the well is still running? The challenges are great, and they start with governance. Good governance ushers an era where basic justice is applied. Once that justice is there, people develop faster. Once justice is established, the main crippling enemy, which is ignorance, will get rid of that. And that could be targeted simultaneously with providing basic needs such as water and medicine. Only then we can successfully eradicate all the ills that hinder the joy of maintaining human rights of people. 
We have governments that act as feudal lords, and we know the West could not have come up with the evolved Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It first had to eradicate feudalism in all its forms. The governments of the Horn of Africa are the major impediment to adapting the concept of human rights, which many in our region understand to mean justice, simply. For under a just system, one cannot be denied basic human rights. Over the last 20 years, Somalis were reaching at each other's throat, despite the fact that they speak, as I said earlier, one language and are all Muslims. Why? It's all bad governance that forces everyone to seek protection to those close to him. Everyone on his own brought clan welfare to the fore. Hopefully, Somalia is going fast towards normalcy, and I'm confident that they will succeed because they are resourceful people. Even in the middle of the fierce wars, some entrepreneurs managed to provide an impressive telecommunications away from government control and regulations. And uh, they created an impressive banking, mainly transfer system that is superb. They created security outfits when the police apparatus collapsed. Of course, they created uh, what, they, what we know, uh, the technical, which is a pickup, uh, and a machine gun is mounted, uh, mounted on it. And those technicals challenge tanks. How they do it, I don't know, but they have done it. As bad as it is, it's innovation, even if it is crude. Good governance will certainly improve the human rights situation in Somalia, provided Somalia defend their land from modern day messiahs, people who seem dead certain on who goes to hell and who goes or is destined for heaven. People like Al Shabaab who think they are the ambassadors of God and earth and destroy the rich Sufi heritage of Somalia and the region. Those kinds of claimants to divinity are the only risks that Somalis have to take care of. And I am not denying they are the product of both bad governance and intolerance exported by those who think they own the truth about everything, the fanatics. <laughs> Ethiopia seems to be doing well, relatively well, compared to the other countries of the region. But the flashy economic development might widen the gap between the poor and the rich. And that is a disaster waiting to happen in a country that is reproducing in an alarming speed. I think there are about 80 million now. But if Ethiopia suffers from poverty, I assure you it's not God's fault. He has bestowed on Ethiopia fertile land, lots of water, a rich multicultural society, and other endowments. Economic dispar disparities might create a risk of arousing ethnic tensions and thus the erosion of the little relative improvements on human rights. Sudan is the perfect example of a bad governance. The Salvation Front government is corrupt to the core. An elite of Sudan is playing the Sudanese social and regional groups against each other. When I was young, the Sudanese were peaceful people. At least that's how we knew them. They were so peaceful that they will avoid any quarrel at any cost. And we used to make fun of them. So many jokes were made about the Sudanese, portraying them as cowards. The Sudan of today is different. It's a militarized society, a fierce society, a country soaked in blood. It has become the center of operation for human traffickers, hostage takers, and criminals who have established a lucrative body power trade. South Sudan does not fare any better when it comes to fragility of the system, but ethnic strife and conflicts have ravaged the young nation from day one. The two governments could not even agree on how to exploit the oil that is their main source of income. My knowledge about South Sudan regarding the situation of human rights is scanty. 
but all the ingredients for the violations of human rights are there, I see them. An arrogant government, a trigger-happy army, and a warrior culture. There, I wish them luck. Now I come to my beloved Eritrea. If my heart would allow me, I would have claimed that I'm not from. I would have claimed that I'm from any other country but Eritrea. The embarrassment I feel due to the ugliness of the government is like nothing the world has seen. I have relatives who have been serving, sometimes carrying a gun and running from one battle to another, sometimes building roads for free, sometimes tending to a general's farm or building a house for him for the last 16 years with no pay. My relative was forcefully conscripted in 1997. He was 18. Now he is 34, not married, never had a chance to have a home to pursue his education or to help his parents. I know people from my childhood who were arrested, no reason given of course, and disappeared since 1994. I cannot possibly tell you enough about Eritrea, but let me tell you about my beloved town, Karen. When I left it, it was a town of hardly 15,000 souls. Everyone knew each other. I grew in a street that started in a place called Hilla Sudan and ended in a place known as the Dugana Police Station, less than a kilometer long. I can practically close my eyes and visualize every house in that street. I can also imagine the situation of, a pe of the people who live there. Most of my generation from that street are either dead during the struggle era or became refugees. Some have uh, resettled. Many are still languishing in refugee camps in Sudan. But a considerable number is here in Australia. Almost every family in that street has a son or a daughter, most probably in this meeting. And we thought that was sad. So much people being forced to leave their homes to save their lives. We were fine with it because we thought it was a struggle and that was the price we had to pay for freedom. We were confident the next generation would drip the fruits, boy, were we wrong. Today, the number of refugees that, Eritrea, that the Eritrean regime created after independence of Eritrea are many fold more than what the Ethiopian occupation created in its 30 years of occupation. The suffering that the supposedly sovereign government of Eritrea created, created is many times more than the suffering and the privation that the Ethiopian government created. In a recent report titled, Hear No Evil, Forced Labor and Corporate Re Responsibility in Eritrea's Mining Sector, Amnesty International describes how the mining companies working in Eritrea risk involvement with the government's widespread exploitation of forced labor. It also documents Nefsen, Canadian company by the way, the first company to develop an operational mine in Eritrea which initially failed to take those risks seriously, and then struggled to others' allegations of abuse connected to its operations. Although the company has subsequently improved its policies, it still seems unable to do so. This is Amnesty, last week's report. Two weeks ago, I went to Perth to give a speech, and I was mesmerized by the mining city. I wished all the mining contracts would be given to Australian companies with a caveat. Turn the desolate village of Bisha, where Novison is using slave labor, into a copy of, of birth. Never mind the river. We don't have it in abundance like this one river. Unless God sends Prophet Noah with flood, flood all the abusive regimes and leave behind something like the Swan River, maybe. Amnesty International, bless its heart, and the, rest of, uh, and, and the restless people at Amnesty and Human Rights Watch 
often write appeals and petitions and call on people to sign letters of appeal to, say, the Justice Minister of Eritrea, Fozia Hashim. They have this beautiful letter and they publicize it and they ask everybody to sign so that it can go to Fozia Hashim to release political prisoners or prisoners one has no way of knowing why they are arrested in the first place. Of course, the world knows that the Eritrean regime doesn't give to such requests and doesn't even have the courtesy of responding to them. If I would find anyone who listens, the appeal should go straight to the president, but not in the form of letters. Those who knowingly or unknowingly finance his military machine, Qatar is one example, or the IMF, or such organizations. Those are the people with enough leverage to make the regime listen. And instead of wasting our time writing petitions and appeals and signatures, it would be a wise decision for anyone who is an activist to go to those people. Because our civil 20-something-year-olds, that strategy has proven that it's not working. It's not working in Africa at all. Or maybe we can influence Italy, where he's believed, our dictator is believed to have some sort of financial and other interests. Maybe learning cannot guess their crime. Back to my 15,000 people, nice town, now it's twice as much. Surrounding villages, people from surrounding villages have migrated to the town. And what I see here is other parts of the world are mostly younger generation who fled the forced labor camps that the Eritrean government created. So there is a chance. Anybody from Sawa here? From the 90s? Okay. So wherever I go, the new arrivals are mostly in their 20s, rarely in their 30s, and those people are all people who fled the labor camps. In such a situation, do you think people worry about freedom of expression or other noble ideas when they lack the basic justice? I'm afraid not. It's not in their priority list. And this is why we are lagging behind on human rights. But governance is to blame. I'm not done airing my views regarding Australia. Maybe now I will. But I have to congratulate Australia for its new role in the Security Council. Last week I read Prime Minister Julia Girard's roadmap for uh, Australian national security. And I hope other countries would have that kind of clarity. Our region lies in the middle of a waterway that is vital for Australia's trade and commerce. And we want Australia to be more involved in the region's affairs and to play a role that many have been considering secondary. Yet, Australia needs to revise all its past relations with that area. One example would suffice. An Australian company established a fiberglass boat factory somewhere in the Red Sea coast of Eritrea. I believe some of the boats found their way to some pirates who we all know in the region. And you know the rest of the story. There are also some mining companies there that were, maybe still are, dealing with the regime that approached native people from their village to grant mining rights to multinationals. The villagers get nothing. I am not going to name the companies consider that a national interest. This is my modest attempt to show those Australian companies that we love them. It's only the deals with tyrants that we don't like. I hope Australia would convince those companies under its jurisdiction not to deal with tyrants and totalitarian regimes. They are not that desperate to find a mining ground. I don't think they are. 
What I think should happen is that the issue of human rights in the Horn of Africa and elsewhere should be seen in a political light. Western governments should be able to pressure, nay, threaten regimes that abuse human rights. They should use real politics and not diplomatic niceties. I believe the excuse that some governments use, they say we have to maintain some sort of working relations, that should be shunned. No human rights respecting government should have any relation with an abusing government. Why would the democracy need to have relations with an authoritarian regime? If I enable a gangster or a criminal, I think the commissioner here will implicate me. The same should apply to Western governments. That answers why many people are angry at the West. Bleeding heart organizations that claim to be exporting human rights values should also at least have enough cultural and linguistic knowledge about the countries in which they intend to operate. I have met some of those, and if the decision was mine, I wouldn't hire them as anything in the places they operate. Western governments should be able to deal in issues of human rights through their embassies and foreign ministers and not through subcontractors, some of whom think it's another five to nine job. Human rights job is not. Those who really need to help the Horn of Africa should empower people whose origins are from that region with strict regulations and directives to prevent the sipping of corruption and avoid using resources meant for the benefit of the people from being used for political ends. Those of you need to take a note of something motivational in front of your eyes. Pray hard to emulate the democracy of this great country and try to emulate and spread the culture of tolerance that you're all enjoying. One final thing, try hard to export ideals of democracy, entrepreneurship, free spirit of a free human being, and fight, fight fiercely, fanatic and extremist views from wherever they come. Be vigilant of destructive views that might cause disruption and chaos within your home, your new home, Australia, and your ancestral home somewhere in the Horn of Africa. Our region deserves a good governance, a democratic environment. Our people deserve to live with dignity, with their human rights respected, and you have a radius system silently reminding you to emulate it. Myself and my team are willing to facilitate contacts for Australian personalities and entities with Eritrean interest groups to provide research, advisory, and consultancy services that would help foster greater relations between those of us who aspire to see a democratic uh, transition in the Horn of Africa and the Australian people. I am sure my compatriots here are doing, are working towards that end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Saleh Gadi. And on behalf of the organization and the Eritrean community, Mr. Shin Tan will thank Saleh for his visit to Australia and speech. Well, you might may call you, of the honor of calling you Gadi. I'm somewhat disappointed that it's taken me two minutes to make friends with you. I normally do it within one minute. <laughs> So I don't know what happened to my magic today. But when I sat with you, that we never met, so there's no magic tricks here. And when you gave your speech, it is not a speech, it's a talk. You, you have actually expanded to us some of those very important issues. It was a reflection of saying, and I said to myself, why is this man a human rights campaigner? What does he offer? What's so special about him that he's got those qualities? That give him that right to be able to be a human rights campaigner. And having heard you and having sat through with you, um, I obviously now come to this conclusion that not only do you have the expertise, the knowledge, and obviously compassion, but you have the one most indelible quality which is very important for any human rights campaigner, and that is you care. 
And for that, thank you very much. Thank you for gracing us today. And I think in, in some ways, you have touched us in a different way. And for that, I think you have therefore proven again that you are indeed a human rights companion because you truly believe in those values that you espouse. Thank you for being with us today.